Chancellor, it is my honor to present to you award-winning journalist and veteran foreign correspondent, Ms. Nala Ayed. Ms. Ayed is a first-generation Canadian whose parents came to Canada as Palestinian refugees. She has spent much of her career covering the Middle East, filing reports for CBC television and radio and its online operations. Her journalism covers a part of the world where reporting often lacks depth or an understanding of the region. It regularly challenges Canadian viewers and listeners while explaining the enormous complexities of the area. She is a skilled reporter who maintains the highest level of journalistic integrity. Canadians have come to depend on Miss Ayad's stories for their insightful analysis about some of the world's most dangerous places. While many journalists gather information from the safety of protected zones, Miss Ayad has always sought out the facts from the front lines and from those most affected by unfolding events. Perhaps you saw a recent Fifth Estate where Ms. Ayed documented the harrowing plight of refugees trying to flee to Europe by boat. She does her reporting often at great personal risk. At times, she has been physically attacked or threatened to be shot. She's even survived the bombing at Kahadimiya Mosque in Baghdad, which killed over 80 people. Ms. Ayed's reports have also been technologically groundbreaking for her profession. During her coverage of the 2007 referendum in Alexandria, Egypt, she was the first correspondent to file stories using a laptop with a webcam. This is now standard practice in journalism. In 2012, Ms. Ayad published A Thousand Farewells, a reporter's journey from refugee camp to the Arab Spring. It was shortlisted for the Governor General's Awards for Literary Merit for the Best in Canadian Nonfiction. Her memoir is an insightful analysis of what it's like to be an Arab-speaking Palestinian Canadian and a woman working in conflict zones. Ms. Ayad has garnered much-deserved praise for her work. In 2002, her series on the living conditions in Canadian women's prisons won a citation for the Michener Award for Meritorious Journalism. She has received the President's Award from the Canadian Press and the Live Wire Re Award for her coverage of the Afghanistan conflict, as well as several Story of the Year and Story of the Month awards from the Canadian Press. Ms. Ayad and CBC colleague Diane Grant won the Canadian Association of Journalists Award for Human Rights Reporting for their story on Hungarian Roma seeking asylum in Canada. She was a finalist for the 2012 JSource News Person of the Year Award and has been nominated for three Gemini Awards for her television reports from Iraq, Iran, and Egypt. Ms. Ayad's stories reflect the human elements of the places she covers. She shares with us the important voices of people who are often ignored. She exemplifies how even-handed, compassionate, and courageous journalism can affect change in the world. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate and the Board of Governors, it is my distinct privilege and honor to present to you Ms. Nala Ayed so that you may confer upon her the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. I'd like to ask Dr. Ayed to now give her remarks to the convocation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. 
Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Chairman of the Board of Governors, Mr. President and Vice Chancellor, honored platform guests, graduating class, and family and friends. I can't possibly thank you uh, enough for this incredible honor, especially for welcoming me into the Concordia family and for the privilege of speaking to you today. The last time I graduated was also a fall convocation like yours. It was 16 years ago, not that long ago. It was actually a fourth convocation I'd had by then. Um, <clears throat> because although, although five if you, if you count grade nine. Um, I admit that I was for a time a bit of a professional student. Um, very serious about my education, but also a little bit of a dreamer. That initially did not sit well with my father, and I'm sure that'll echo somewhere in the back there, um, who preferred to speak about my career plans using the collective we. I, early on, wanted to study music. We can do better, he would say. So ultimately, we decided to enroll in science. I did well, but I didn't do well enough to get into med school, which was our collective dream. <laughs> So instead, I decided to parlay that dream into a BSc and eventually into an MSc. But then I really came into my own and I decided that I was gonna skirt all that and go into an MJ. There definitely was no consensus on that, um, but by then I really knew what I wanted. Still, I returned to make we happy and finished the degree that I had started and that I had left behind, wrote a new thesis, and graduated again with an MA that we could all be proud of. So it's a long start to a journey of realizing my dreams. And you're about to embark on that journey, on the next leg of that journey, and hopefully in a straighter line than I did. Of course, that makes today not so much the end of a chapter as much as it is the start of a, an entirely new story. And so it is a moment that has the sound and the feel of turning a page or the revving of an engine or the starting up of a computer. That's how I imagine it. It's the opening of a story that's laced with words and feelings like apprehensive, like excited, perhaps anxious, overwhelmed, uncertain, maybe even downright lost. On top of all that, you happen to be pursuing your dreams in a world that is on the precipice of a new kind of uncertainty. Never before has the world quite looked the way it does right now on November 7th, 2016. To get serious for a moment, I mean, it is a time when intolerance has again gone mainstream. It's a time when it's become far easier to highlight differences than it is to look for common ground. It's a time when news is sometimes served up by algorithms and when truth, frankly, has become optional. Your generation's war, and sadly every generation has one, is a supersized war. It's one of the most brutal in the modern age, despite its anything but modern tendency towards violence. The conflict in Syria is what I'm talking about, is so deep that it has cleaved that region, but the whole world. It's affected us directly here in Canada in a way that we haven't seen in decades. It's also contributed to an unprecedented worldwide displacement of 65.3 million people with that many dreams that have been set aside because of oppression or because of conflict. About the same as the population of the UK, by the way. All clamoring for the right to pursue their dreams too. Why does that matter? Well, the pursuit of dreams has always been an equalizer. It's what we all strive for and what we all struggle for, as I've said and seen repeatedly around the world. So from the 11-year-old boy that I remember in India who learned how to embroider so he could help support his family, to the young woman who, unlike me, did have the marks and did get into medical school and graduated as a doctor from a school in Damascus. And if people aren't pursuing dreams, they're often in desperate pursuit of the opportunity to pursue dreams. People like the young men and women that I met last month taking on the whole of the Mediterranean Sea, an entire sea, in an unthinkably dangerous attempt to get at a better life. To try, despite impossible odds, to float away in search of reliable terra firma. They have no choice but to take the long, dangerous way to pursuing their dreams. And when I asked actually one of them what she hoped to do when she got to Europe, she said to have fun 
like you. It's amazing what we take for granted. But for the random fate to be born in a place that no one would willingly choose, very little separates them from you and me. You too have chosen light over darkness to struggle and strive to reach for the certainty of knowledge over the seas of ignorance, to drift away from dead ends to possibility. The difference is you've been doing it without risking your life. And yet we all know, and that's why we're here today, that your pursuit was not and is not without risk or sacrifice. I urge you to look around right now, to consider the struggles and the sacrifices that it took to fill this big room. The struggles of the students, but also the sacrifices of the parents, like my mother and father, who gave everything to defend your and my right just to dream. Think of the long hours that they worked or the long distances they traveled, the poverty or the cruelty they endured and survived in so many corners of this country, but also around the world, just to get you here today. So as you look forward, I urge you to remember all that. Remember all these faces in this room and to be proud. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid at all. There's no reason to be. To think big. To do justice to the sheer size of their ambitions for you. And I urge you to draw inspiration from your own potential to do good, not just here in Canada, but around the world. Ask those like your parents who know that having hope, so I'm asking you to be hopeful too, is the only way to ensure that your dreams are realized. But to also be patient, especially with yourselves, because sometimes there is no avoiding the long way to realizing your dreams. And if I can leave you with one thought, just one thought, it's that there is no right way to pursue your dreams. I can attest to that. But remember my father's we. We look to you for hope as well. At a time, as I mentioned, when intolerance has gone mainstream, we look to you for broad-mindedness, to defend equality no matter the religion, the color, sexual orientation, or any other of the convenient excuses that humans use to differentiate themselves from others or to pretend they're better than others. At a time when it is easier to highlight difference, we look to you to find common ground, to use your knowledge to build bridges, both of the figurative and the concrete kind, to connect us, not walls that keep us apart. And at a time when the truth has become optional, we look to you to stand up for it. We also look to you to make room for our messy world in the pursuit of your dreams because there is no escaping it. My father was right. It is a collective exercise, all of this. So we are all invested in the promise that you represent. So by pursuing your, pursuing your dreams to the best of your ability, you're actually pursuing our dreams. And so whatever, whatever is happening outside these walls, whatever happens tomorrow or in six weeks or in six months or in six years, in this room with you present, today has the promising feel of that turning of a page, the revving of an engine and the unfolding of a wide open future. It is the start of something huge, big, something inspiring, hard won, and really precious. Congratulations, and thank you very much. Dr. Ayed, we, I mean I, would like to thank you for sharing your journey and your dreams with us here today, one filled with passion and with courage and with a voice that has been shared with the entire world and today our students. We thank you.